The late writer, Primo Levi, said that Holocaust survivors can be divided into two distinct categories. Those who talk about the Holocaust and those who don't. Pain is important to speak about because when we do, it can help us cope with it. And when speaking to others about pain, it can help the listeners deal with it as well. It's amazing to me that there are people who can express their emotions about tragedies so well. People like W.H. Auden, who wrote the poem Musée de Beauart about suffering. And people like Joan Didion, who wrote the whole book, The Year of Magical Thinking, about the year that she lost her husband and daughter. It confuses me th that there are people who may have gone through something even more brutal and can't seem to speak about it. On the other hand, I fall into the category of people that do want to speak about their tragedies. Coincidentally, my tragedy happened on this very day. Exactly four years ago, today, April 21st, 2014, my dad died. I was nine years old, and what happened forever changed me. We had just gotten back from our trip to Quebec, his birthplace, and it was a Sunday before school. As he tucked me into bed that night, he said goodbye. Later that night, I had a weird feeling, so I went to sleep in my parents' room. When I woke up the next morning, my mom asked me to get my dad to take me to school. When I tried to wake him up, he did not budge. A few days later, I spoke at his funeral with very simple words. All I did was thank everybody for being there. But now, four years later, I know that my words as a nine-year-old did not suffice. But I still didn't know how to give my dad the honor he deserves with my own words. And because I was having trouble, I looked to people that have spoken about tragedies with eloquence. After the Parkland, Florida shooting, student activist Emma Gonzalez spoke on March 24th, 2018 at the March for Our Lives event. She spoke for six minutes, 20 seconds, about the shooting at her school that had resulted in the deaths of 17 people that she knew. Part of this six minutes, 20 seconds was filled with complete silence. The reason Ms. Gonzalez remained silent was so people could feel how long six minutes and 20 seconds is when you're fearing for your life and you know others you care about are dying. Then I watched Valerie Castile speak. She spoke on June 16th, 2017, about her feelings towards the Minnesota legal system. Her son, Philando Castile, an African-American man, was pulled over on the side of the road for a broken headlight and was shot seven times after telling the officer who asked him to pull out his ID that he had a legal firearm on him. Also on June 16th, the officer was exonerated of all charges. Ms. Gonzal er, Ms. Castile spoke outside of the courthouse for a minute 54 seconds, and her words were full of fury, power, and control. And as amazing as Ms. Gonzalez's and Ms. Castile's words are, they're not mine. And to give my father the honor I'd like, I have to use my own 13-year-old words. On the night of my dad's funeral, after all of our friends and family had left, I was in the hot tub with my paternal uncle and my brother. We all had glasses. I was drinking Sprite out of my dad's favorite martini glass. As I was taking a sip, the heat from the hot tub shattered my dad's hand bone glass. A piece of the glass fell directly into my arm, and in an instant, everybody was out of the bloody hot tub. I was so terrified that I felt no pain, but I did feel the fear of death. After wrapping my arm in a towel, my mom called an ambulance for me, even though my brother was yelling at her not to. Although I may not have needed the towel or the ambulance, my mom still got one for me anyways because of all the emotions I was going through that night. On the way to the hospital, with my brother driving right behind us, I was answering tons of questions in the back of the ambulance. After checking that there was no glass stuck in my arm, they put me into a room while I distracted myself with one of those finger things that checks your pulse and makes sure I'm still alive. The the doctor finally came in to sew me up after I was distracted by my brother for two and a half hours. He washed out my arm, numbed it, and finally gave me my stitches. The stitches themselves were not painful, but watching them was excruciating. After that, I went home and I still don't remember anything else. I do remember the feeling in my arm that I don't have anymore. And I do remember getting the stitches taken out, leaving little white holes in my suntan skin. Sam Levine, the best that I could ever ask for, will always be here with me, my family, and my friends. And although I do miss playing Frisbee with Sam Levine, the thing I miss about him most are his corny, cheesy, annoying, and very funny jokes. Thank you.